Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hello. I'm the Reverend William Levwood. I'm the minister here at Akatink Unitarian Universalist Church. My pronouns are he and him. As we begin our service, I invite you to silence your phone if you're in person. Take a deep breath and center yourself for worship. We open in welcome to the ancestral people of this land, acknowledging that our church, like all of Burke, rests on the unceded territory of the Monahoic tribe of the Great Sioux Nation. We seek healing and the realization of justice with the people of this land who live on in their descendants, the present day members of the Monacan Indian Nation, the Potawomac Indian Tribe of Virginia and the Piscataway Indian Nation. We honor the ancestors as we move toward healing so that all together shall one day know full justice. No matter how uncomfortable it is, we must pay attention and we must speak out against the hate, racism, and violence that is overwhelming our country today. Demi Lovato. Good morning. Morning. And welcome to Akatink Unitarian Universalist Church. I'm Paulette Lickman Panzer, and I'm happy to be your worship associate today. This congregation is a welcoming and inclusive community that seeks to create a more just and compassionate world. If you're new to Akatink and would like to talk more about this church, just about anyone in this room can help you out. If you're a first timer or even a second timer, look around if we've got a, a stitch name tag on, talk to Rev, talk to me. Um, we can tell you all about um, this church and how long we've been around. Whether you're a longtime member or a newcomer or something in between, we encourage you to stay for our social hour online and in person immediately after the service. We're glad that you came this morning. We have a proposed new mission statement in this congregation. I am so excited and so grateful to the task force that did such good work. So the proposed new mission statement is that Akatank Unitarian Universalist Church is a welcoming and inclusive spiritual home where we inspire each other to live our values. Together, we care in community grow in spirit, and act for justice. There's also a short paragraph that's been shared about each of those areas of focus that we can use on our website. The mission statement task force worked really hard. Like I said, I'm, I'm really grateful and uh, proud of the work they've done to develop a brief and memorable statement that says who this congregation is and what we do together. So, I want to give an announcement early in the service that I, I want to encourage people, uh, even urge people to come to a special congregational meeting to vote on whether to adopt this new mission statement two Sundays from now, so on March 5th after the service. And if you have questions about the mission statement or the process of developing it or anything you want to talk about about it, you can come to a discussion after the service next Sunday, not today, but one week from now, um, and ask the task force any questions you have. So uh, that second phrase in that mission statement, together we care in community, grow in spirit, and act for justice, succinctly names the three areas after membership growth that you named in the Kajic meetings that were part of the contract to call process when you chose me as your settled minister. Um, so I just wanted to point out that we've already been doing this work and the mission statement can help to focus and guide our efforts. For example, the first Sunday this month, we explored how we care in community. You might remember I talked about relational neuroscience and the importance of being around people who are calm, accepting, resonant, and energetic who energize you. 
And then last Sunday, we talked about how love is the power that holds us together and how we are accountable to each other for living our shared values through the spiritual discipline of love. Those phrases about love are from the pro proposed revisions to our Unitarian Universalist principles. So that's our denomination-wide principles. I was just talking about our specific to this congregation mission statement. Um, if you want to know more about those proposed revisions, there's a lot of change going on. It's exciting. If you want to know about that, there's an after church discussion today about that. So I really encourage you to come to that. That's going to be voted on at our General Assembly this summer, and we need to know how you feel about it so that your delegates can uh, represent you uh, for that vote. And also, it's just good to know it's, it's a core part of who we are, our principles, um, and they might change. Uh, so exploring how to put love at the center of UU faith, that language that comes from those proposed new principles, we explored that in last week's sermon as a way to grow in spirit together. And today we're gonna to look at how we act for justice. And this congregation does that in so many, many ways, but we're not gonna to talk today about how this congregation does it, but again, we're gonna go at the denominational level and talk about our Side with Love initiative, which is our Unitarian Universalist Association's justice campaign. Well, the kids are not going downstairs today for religious education, and I'm the designated storyteller. So <laughs> for you all right here and those of you at home, story called Heather Has Two Mommies, and it's by Leslie Newman. Heather lives in a little house with a big apple tree in the front yard and lots of tall grass in the backyard. Well, Heather's favorite number is two because she has two arms, two legs, two ears, two eyes, two hands, and of course, two feet. She also has two pets a ginger colored cat named Ginger Snap, and a big black dog named Midnight. Heather also has two mommies, Mama Jane and Mama Kate. One day, Mama Kate and Mama Jane tell Heather, you're going to be in a play group. They explain that there's gonna be lots of other children and a teacher whose name is Molly. So the next day, Mama Kate and Mama Jane take Heather to her play group. She meets her teacher, Molly, walks around noticing all the fun things to play with. Soon it's time for Mama Jane and Mama Kate to leave. So they kiss Heather goodbye and she cries, but just a little bit. In the morning, Heather builds a big tower out of building block, dressed up like a firefighter. Then she paints two pictures at the easel, one for Mama Jane and one for Mama Kate. She drinks apple juice out of her favorite red cup at lunchtime, and she sleeps in the quiet corner with her favorite blue blanket at nap time. After nap time, everyone sits in a circle, and Molly reads a story about a little boy whose father is a veterinarian. He takes care of dogs and cats and birds and fish whenever they get sick. My daddy is a doctor too, says one, pointing at the book. He takes care of six pe sick people. My daddy is a teacher, David says. Once I went to school with him. I don't have a daddy, Heather says. She realizes that she hadn't thought about that before. Did everyone except Heather have a daddy? Heather's forehead wrinkled up and she began to cry. Molly picks Heather up and gives her a hug. Not everyone has a daddy, Molly says. You have two mommies, and that's pretty special. Miriam doesn't have a daddy either. She has a mommy and a babysitter. That's pretty special, too. I don't have any mommies. I have two daddies, Stacy says. I have two daddies, too, Joshua says. My mommy and my stepdaddy live in a blue house, and my daddy lives by himself in a yellow house. Well, let's all draw pictures of our family, as the teacher says. The children all sit at the big round table, and the teacher hands out paper and crayons. Juan has a mommy and a daddy and a big brother named Carlos. 
In her picture, Miriam's mommy is pushing her baby sister on the swing in the park. Stacy likes to sit between her two daddies on the big red couch in the living room and listen to a story. In his picture, Joshua's mom and stepfather are dropping him off at his dad's house. David's mommy and daddy adopted him, his two brothers and his big sister. Molly, the teacher, hangs up all the pictures and everyone looks at them. It doesn't matter how many mommies or how many daddies your family has, the, te has, the teacher says to the children. It doesn't matter if your family has sisters or brothers or cousins or grandmothers or grandfathers or uncles or aunts. Every family is special. The most important thing about a family is that all the people in it love each other. Soon after this, Heather's mommies come to take her home. Heather has a really big smile on her face. Mama Kate and Mama Jane give Heather a great big hug. Heather gives each of her mommies two kisses, and then she takes their hands, and they head home together. So in the winter of 2004, UU composer Jason Shelton was sitting in on a meeting as then UUA president Bill Sinkford, the first uh, black man to lead a predominantly white denomination as president, as Bill Sinkford crafted his response to then US President George W. Bush, Bush's introduction of a constitutional amendment to ban same-sex marriage. The composer Jason Shelton sat there and he heard Bill Sinkford say, we stand on the side of love. He was so inspired in that moment that he wrote down to the, the chorus, to the song right then and there. Later that day, he would sit down at a piano and play that chorus for the commission that was preparing our hymnal, our new hymnal at that time, singing the journey, the teal hymnal. That summer at General Assembly, the annual national meeting of Unitarian Universalists, standing on the side of love would be featured as a hymn in the Sunday morning worship service to show our support as a faith for marriage equality. And later, this would become the tagline for our collective social justice efforts, which I'll say more about later in the service. Okay, story number two. But, you know, as with most children's stories, there's always a point, right? One morning at a school somewhere in this country, as children settled into their seats, the classroom door opened and a new child joined the class. The girl's name was Maya. The teacher, Miss Albert, said, say good morning to the new student, everybody. But most of us were silent. Her coat was open and the clothes beneath them looked kind of old and ragged. Her shoes had a broken strap on one of them and weren't the right kind of shoes for winter. Well, we all stared at her. The only empty seat was next to me. So that's where our teacher put Maya. On that first day, Maya turned to me and she smiled, but I didn't smile back. I looked away and I, I moved my chair, myself and my books a little further away from her. And every day after that, when Maya came into the classroom, I looked away and I never smiled back. My name is Chloe and my best friends that year were Kendra and Sophie. At lunchtime, we would walk around the schoolyard, our fingers laced together, whispering into each other's ears. One day when we were near the slide, Maya came over to us. She held out her hand to show us a tiny red ball she had gotten for her birthday. It's, it's a high bouncer, she said, but none of us wanted to play with her. So Maya played by herself. That afternoon when we got back into the classroom, Maya whispered to me about her high jumping ball. Behind me, I heard Andra say, Chloe's got a new friend. Chloe's got a new friend. I turned around to face him and said, she's not my friend. The weeks passed. Every day we whispered about Maya, 
laughing at her clothes, her shoes, the strange food she brought for lunch, the funny way she spoke. Some days she would hold out her hand to show us what she brought to school, a deck of cards, a small tattered doll. Whenever she asked to play with us, we said no. The days grew warmer and warmer. One day, Maya came to school wearing a pretty dress and fancy shoes. But the shoes and the dress looked like they belonged to some other girl before Maya. I have a new name for her, my friend Kendra said. Never knew. We all laughed. Maya stood by the fence. She was holding a jump rope, but this time she didn't come over to ask us if we wanted to play. After a while, she folded it double, rolled the ends around each hand, and started jumping. She jumped around the whole schoolyard without ever stopping once. She didn't look up either. She just jumped and jumped and jumped. The next day, Maya's seat was empty. In class that morning, we talked about kindness. Miss Albert brought a big bowl into class and filled it with water. We all gathered around her desk and watched her drop a small, smooth stone into it. Tiny waves rippled out, away from the stone. This is what kindness does, Miss Albert said. Each little thing we do goes out, like a ripple into the world. Then Miss Albert let us each drop the stone in as we told her what kind things each of us had done. Joseph had held the door for his grandmother. Kendra had helped change her baby brother's diaper. Even mean old Andrew had done something. I carried teacher's books up the stairs, he proudly said. And Miss Albert said that that was true. I stood there holding Miss Albert's rock in my hand, totally quiet. Even small things count, Miss Albert said gently. I couldn't think of anything, and I passed the stone away. Maya didn't come to school the next day or the day after that. Each morning, I walked to school slowly, hoping this would be the day Maya returned, and she'd look at me and smile, and I promised myself this would be the day I would smile back. Each kindness, Miss Albert had said, makes the whole world a little bit better. But Maya's seat remained empty. One day, Miss Albert announced to the class that Maya would not be coming back. Her family had to move away, Miss Albert said. That afternoon, I walked home alone. When I reached the pond, my throat filled with all the things I wished I would have said to Maya. Each kindness I had never, ever shown. I threw small stones into it over and over, watching the way the water rippled out and away, out and away, like each kindness done and not done, like every girl somewhere holding a small gift out to someone and that someone turning away from it. I watched the water ripple as the sun set through the maples and the chance of a kindness with Maya becoming more and more forever gone. So not every story has a happy ending. At the General Assembly in 2012, Unitarian Universalists traveled to Arizona to turn their attention to immigration justice. Two years earlier, in 2010, Arizona had passed a controversial anti-immigration law, much of which would later be deemed unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Unitarian Universalists decided to hold our, a Justice General Assembly focused on bearing witness for immigration justice right there at the heart of the battle in Arizona. That June of 2012, more than 2,500 people held up candles outside of a tent city for undocumented, undocumented immigrants as they chanted, shut it down shut it down. 
It would be another four years before Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who had been sheriff of Maricopa County for 25 years, lost his reelection bid in 2016. And it was still another year before the new sheriff shut down the tent city that had housed undocumented immigrants in inhumane conditions, with only two meals a day, stifling summer heat, and the reinstitution of chain gangs, conditions that had continued for more than 20 years. Today, we still have work to do on immigration justice. Here at Akatink, we've provided support to immigrants who were dropped in DC by the governors of other states. We as Unitarian Universalists have a commitment to siding with love, to standing on the side of love, a slogan for a campaign that began by advocating for marriage equality that also speaks powerfully, I think, to immigration justice with the language of siding with love bringing to mind a border. In Jacqueline Woodson's story, we don't learn much about Maya. We can tell that she's poor. The story tells us that she ate strange food. We could guess that she may be a refugee. She might be an immigrant. Which causes me to wonder when the story says that she had to move away, I wonder if her family or a member of her family was deported. We have a choice in this country to show up for the rights of immigrants. Poet Joy Harjo says, each act of kindness is a light in the battle for justice. And Jacqueline Woodson's story shows how each act of kindness, each act for justice in the world, drops a stone that ripples out. In the example of the tent city in Arizona, it took many people standing up, showing up for many years, but eventually it did make a difference. In recent years, the Side with Love campaign has turned its attention towards racial justice and the Black Lives Matter movement. Congregations all over this country have put up, UU congregations have put up Black Lives Matter banners, including here at Akatink. You can see it on our sign as you come in. In many places, these banners have been torn down or defaced. Always, they've been put back up again. We've also been making changes within our association to look at how our structures support a culture of white supremacy. Now, I know that term rubs some of us the wrong way, as does for some of us the phrase Black Lives Matter. I believe that's by design. We need to see that black lives do not matter in this country as much as other lives. That's what our institutions and our structures and our collective actions show. Black lives matter is an ironic statement. It's a call for black lives to matter not more than other lives, but as much as other lives in this country. White supremacy culture is a term that shows our complicity in racist systems and structures and how that spreads the violence of racism even more effectively than the acts of extremists. As the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. pointedly asserted many, many years ago, decades ago, in his letter from a Birmingham jail, the lack of action from liberal and moderate whites props up white supremacy more effectively than the actions of segregationists. White supremacy culture, that phrase, is a deliberately provocative term that attempts to bring this difficult truth to light. I spoke last week about being accountable to each other and how we lived our shared values and shared that sometimes some of the ways I have not been accountable is by not doing things when they needed to be done, by not having the courage 
In Jacqueline Woodson's story, we see this with Chloe's character. For the most part, she's not actively mean to Maya. She's passively mean. And I get it, she wants to belong. She wants to be a part of that group of friends that is also shunning Maya. And that is often how we are formed in our racial identities and our gender identities and our sexual identities. We learn, this is from UU theologian Tandeka, she points out that we learn what it means to be white and how to fit into that whiteness when we're young, when we desperately need the belonging that comes with group identity. We also learn that around maleness or femaleness. We learn that about being straight. And then Tandeka says, we project onto the other all of those qualities that we've been told are not good. So if we're told don't be weak, those other people are the weak ones. If we've been told not to lie, those other people are the ones who lie, and so on and so forth. We need to do more than just not actively support unjust immigration laws. We need to do more than just not be racist. We need to be actively working for immigration justice. We need to be actively engaged in anti-racist efforts. We need to be reaching out our arms in love. When we drop stones of kindness and of justice, it sends ripples out into the world. Those ripples are like embracing arms of love reaching out. Of course, I'm not saying it's always easy to know what to do or that we all have to do exactly the same things or approach these things in the same ways. I know we have many responsibilities and challenges pulling us in multiple directions. I know we have different ideas about how to approach these problems, and that's a good thing. I just know I don't want to find myself one day throwing stone after stone into a pond watching the rip, water ripple out and away, thinking about all the ways I didn't reach out my arms in love. And I got another story, here we go. This one is called Featherless. It's uh, adapted from a story by uh, Herrera. In this story, a father brings home an unusual pet for his son. A little pet, Tomasita, for you. You mean the one that gray pebble for, has a gray pebble for a foot and, and a tiny curled up leg, Tomasino asks. He was born a little different, like you were, his father says, holding out the bird to his son who stares back at him from his wheelchair. It's not like me, Poppy, Tomasito says. He doesn't have spina bifida. So spina bifida is a problem back here in the back. And he's featherless on top of it all, Papa. Well, Papa says, you can call him desplumado, his father says. But Poppy, if he doesn't have feathers, he can't fly. Smile, Tomasito. Why are you so sad, Marlena asks, as they go to class and he's trying. She draws a soccer ball with wings. Tomasita draws a volcano that's blowing up. Smiling is tough, he whispers, as tough as making new friends. We just moved here. Back in Mendota, I knew everyone. Now everybody asks me all over again, why am I in a wheelchair? Why, Tomasita? Why, 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 she asks, to make him laugh a little bit. See, I told you, he says. When I was born, my spinal cord wasn't completely formed. Marlena gives him her drawing. Are we friends? Sure. The next day, under the morning sun, Poppy waits with Tomasito for the school bus to arrive. You've been grumpy all morning, he says. You didn't want to eat. You didn't want to go to school. What is it? 
Well, at school today, nobody ever invites me to play. At recess, I sit alone and count soccer balls slamming into the net. Things take time, Tomasito. Paciencia, that means patience. The bus arrives and the chairlift descends to lift Tomasito onto the bus. And then later that day, Fresno Flyers practice, let's go, Marlena yells from the soccer field. Kids race across the grass, sweeping like kites above an emerald sea. Marlena asks Tomasito if he wants to play. But I can't kick the ball, Tomasito replies. Well, be a flyer, she says. Use your wings. Wings, he wonders. Does she mean my wheelchair? So he joins the practice. After practice, coach says, our fastest runner has the flu. What in the heck should we do? What about Tomasito, Marlena asks, winking at him. Tomasito, who, coach says. Me, Tomasito says, from Mendota. You, says coach, wrinkling his forehead. You, everyone says. Tomasito spins the ball fast on his head. Coach thinks hard and fast for a minute. Then he says, you're in, Tomasito, and pats him on the back. In the game, Tomasito stretches out his head to hit the ball. He misses the goal, but Marlena shouts, good cabeza shot. Cabeza means head. Good cabeza shot, Tomasito. I didn't know I could play soccer, Tomasito thinks. His hands are red and sore from zigzagging his wheelchair across the field. Marlena passes the ball to him again, and he almost makes a wobbly cabeza, cabeza, cabeza there I go, cabeza goal. The next morning, as Tomasito dreams, he imagines blowing stars from the sky over his bird, Desplumado, featherless. The parrot's wings burst open and his leg uncurls, and both boy and bird are flying, flying. Tomasito wakes up inspired by that dream. Maybe I can lift myself up from the bed, he thinks. Maybe I can slap one foot in front of the other. He presses down on the bed to lift himself up onto his feet, up, up, almost standing. And then everything gets wavy and flashy with light. There's a loud crash, and he falls. His father rushes into the room and helps him onto the bed. I want Desplumado to fly, Tomasito says. You mean you want to fly, hijo, his father says. I know, Poppy, says Tomasito. When I play with my friends, something in me wants to go faster, so, so I can be just like them. You are already like them. You're a Fresno flyer, his father tells him. Desplumado nods his little naked bird head and shakes his smooth wings. At the next game, Tomasito winks at his father in the crowd before he calls out, Fresno Flyer, let's go! Tomasito heads down the field. His friend Marlena passes him the ball. He reaches his head out and scores a goal with a cabeza shot, his wheelchair almost tipping over. Tomasito, Tomasito, the crowd cheers, go! That day, Tomasito races his father home. He rushes over to Desplomato's cage. I made a goal, the Fresno Flyers won. He opens the little wire gate and Desplumado jumps out onto his hand. You can be a flyer too, Tomasito tells his bird. There's more than one way to fly. Tomasito smiles, his heart beating faster, so fast it feels just like soaring. So some stories do have a happy ending. In August of 2016, Jason Shelton changed the words to this hymn from standing on the side of love to answering the call of love. He did this in solidarity with people like Tomasito, people who can't stand. Then at the 2017 General Assembly in New Orleans, delegates voted overwhelmingly in favor of a resolution to change the name of the standing on the side of love campaign which is now known as the Side with Love campaign. 
Changing the lyrics of this hymn makes something that is usually or often invisible or at least unnoticed visible. It makes us aware of something that we often are unaware of. And the point isn't to be perfect in how we use our language in every instance. The point isn't to remove all language that isn't fully inclusive. It isn't even that. The request from those of differing abilities is that we bring their experience into the room. That if we sing a song like Guide My Feet, for example, that we mention at the very least that not everyone is able to walk on their feet. The request is that we begin to become aware of the differing abilities in the room. That's why I say rise in body or in spirit. It's important that we make space for everyone in the room. It's important that we say to ourselves and to each other, there's more than one way to fly. There's more than one way to answer the call of love. As we extinguish our flame, I invite you to join in our community blessing with these words from David Bumbaugh. This church is dedicated to the proposition that behind all our differences and beneath all our diversity, there is a unity that makes us one and binds us forever together in spite of time, death, and the space between the stars. We pause now in silent witness to that unity.